So it's my great pleasure to introduce Liz Camp as today's Brown Bag uh, speaker. Liz is, is an associate professor of philosophy and joined Rutgers in 2013 after being on the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania and three years at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Before earning her PhD at Berkeley, she designed and implemented programs for GED instruction in public housing and ESL instruction in the Latino community of Chicago. Now, um, so many of us here use language as a primary source of data about learning, teaching, and other experiences. We code interviews, we code focus groups, we observe interactions, code those. And for most of this, for most of us, we do this at a pretty macro level. We try to make meanings of utterances or interactions by exercising some rules of judgment that result in some type of classification in a coding scheme. And we calibrate our interpretations by considering such issues as whether others would make similar kinds of interpretations. But you know, what are the underlying processes of, of meaning making from the perspectives of those who produce language, the speaker, or those who interpret it, the listener? Now people in this camp. So thank you so much for having me uh, here for the invitation. Um, I'm really happy to uh, sort of, uh, access to another and get you know some wings with another part of. Uh, I apologize. I old speed to be able to survey the entire sort of range of what I want to say and um, and maybe take it away with you and study it in detail afterwards. Right? So um, especially for the lives to some kind of relation going on there. Um, so does everybody have a hand up? Good. So, um, so what I want to about today um, and uh, the people one of the first things people often remark about metaphor uh, is that they're really powerful cognitive tools right and what part of what makes them powerful communicative tools is that they're powerful they have these powerful effects on us uh, in our minds I don't know some of you are five or so uh, about the ways in which we're on the framing game and really we're doing a Debates and certain uh, you know, issues in certain kinds of ways, and uh, uh, our Democrats was you know undermining their success and um, uh, politically. So, so I mean that's an important starting point for thinking about metaphor. Metaphor is pervasive in our you know common discourse, uh, and it's really and it's pervasive partly because it's a very uh, useful cognitive tool. Um, uh, and leads to people taking a negative attitude toward the use of metaphor, especially in serious, reflective debate in the sort of Lakoff, you know, for him, the bad guys are saying, right? Um, uh, for, you know, long tradition, so Hobbes, Locke, uh, talking about the way in which metaphors are fundamentally deceptive and, uh, you know, pain. Um, in false pictures, and after all, I mean, there's a common uh, refrain that philosophers, certainly uh, by uh, educators, that if you want to do serious, uh, sort of above board thinking and talking, you should strive to eliminate metaphor as much as possible because it has these potentially pernicious. People are denialists. Still, heuristic serve as a useful sort of uh, rhetorical tool to serve people into paying attention, but they standing genuine sort of um, uh, uh, not me. So I don't know uh, the range from sort of. Uh, denialism, therefore, you know, sort of rejection of 
what I love is you that, you know, at least you have some tools to rebut. If you're already on a matter to say that they're, you know, more enthusiast. Um, if you're a uh, metaphor, you know, sort of denialist that uh, you shouldn't shouldn't be, but also that um, what's equally important is that uh, you know we so we should use metaphors for learning, in particular in the context of education. Metaphors can provide a really important um, pedagogical tool, and uh, both in understanding particular domains and cultivating the capacity to think metaphorically, and uh, can be a really useful cognitive skill. But also with that comes a commensurate and equally important uh, responsibility to use metaphors critically and think about how to uh, engage with them critically, right? So they're powerful tools. They can be used for good. They can be used for ill. And uh, for that very reason, they need to be used critically, just like chainsaws, right? I mean, you know, very powerful tools. <laughs> you can cut off your arm. You can cut off a tree trunk. So be careful how you use them, right? Okay. So that's my overall lesson for the day. Um, Okay, so uh, so basically three parts to the talk. The first part, I want to just sketch in sort of extremely rapid fire form uh, what I the, what I think what I think makes metaphors really powerful cognitive devices. Just my way of thinking about this. Um, so actually focusing more on metaphors in cognition rather than on their rhetorical role in language. Um, though that. that argue that they can. for understanding and for the achievement of knowledge. And then third, I want to talk about the sort of standards for critical use and assessment of metaphor. Um, okay, so people very often when they're talking about metaphor, you know, as I said, one of the first things they talk about is saying, oh yeah, metaphors are really powerful for good or for ill because they give us perspectives, open-ended, powerful, you know, uh, sort of intuitive perspectives on a certain situation. Uh, topic. Um, they frame the topic in certain kinds of ways. They make us see one thing as another. I think that language, that sort of visual language of seeing as and perspectives is extremely powerful and compelling, but it is itself so, uh, almost always, I mean, well, you, sometimes you actually are seeing something, but things that are absent. Um, uh, there are lots of talk about you use metaphors talk about which are abstract and can't be visualized or seen. So for instance, when um, uh, experience, you know, uh, life is but a walking shadow, you know, how are you supposed to see life and how are you supposed to see it as but a walking shadow? And even when you can see something as something, it's not clear that that's the right kind of cognitive activity. So when Romeo says Juliet is the sun, you know, if you tried to sort of visualize her as the sun, that seems like the wrong kind of imaging is not the right kind of activity. So the first thing we need to do is get a, a clearer on what it means to say the metaphors make us see one thing as something else. So my view is a kind of version of a sort of view that's been around. Max Black is the most uh, sort of uh, prominent, relatively recent promulgator of this view. Uh, Deirdre Gentner at uh, Northwestern is an important person in psychology who has defended a related kind of view about analogy uh, through, you know, for over a long uh, illustrious career. Um, so I have a version of that kind of view. So basically, I think that in metaphor, one one way of thinking, an intuitive way of thinking, structures our understanding of something else, much as uh, when we, since this figure on the, uh, one, one concept structures our overall understanding of, in that case, an image. So that's part of what, part of what I want to do is make uh, explicit why the analogy with seeing as is really compelling in even the cognitive domain. So, um, so what I think metaphors do is, um, right, so metaphors employ and express perspectives which enable a kind of configurational comprehension. Getting, carry, understanding something in a, 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 a subject in, a, in a, a configuration of disparate elements in a, a common sort of structure um, by framing one thing in terms of something else. Um, so, uh, in uh, metaphorical comprehension, that's where uh, one thought is structuring our thinking about something else. So, what are these thoughts that are doing? They're being, you know, structuring and being structured. Um, just to sort of regiment my own terminology and sort of know what I'm talking about, I call these characterizations. Stereotypes are a special instance of characterization, so that's a useful thing to sort of have in your mind. But it's important that 
Um, you can have characterization. Stereotypes, I think, are community-wide ways of thinking about a uh, type. You know, so uh, criminals, uh, women, you know, um, uh, sorry, criminals, women. Um, uh, uh, but um, it's in important that uh, characterization is the same kind of intuitive ways of thinking about you know individuals and I can have pretty idiosyncratic ways of thinking but so you know there's the the woman who works at the barista at the coffee shop around the corner I have a sort of intuitive way of thinking about her and that's, I wouldn't call that a stereotype right so characterizations are a more general class of which stereotypes are an instance so let me tell you some things about that, and I don't expect this will matter that much, but for me, characterizations are distinct from concepts, even though they're a lot like what psychologists often mean by concepts. Um, uh, and we can talk about that in great depth if you want after, why I think that's important. Uh, that distinction is important. Okay, so what are characterizations? They're, these, they're intuitive ways of thinking about uh, a subject, right? That's the sort of starting point. They're informationally rich. They bundle together lots of, you know, sort of encyclopedic knowledge about the subject. Um, they're often experientially vivid. So I have a, a characterization, which I think is a stereotype, of um, quarterbacks. And part of my characterization of quarterbacks includes them sort of, you know, they sort of stand like this and, you know, they um, uh, have a certain kind of, well, um, they have a certain kind of like square jaw and gleaming smile, you know, the sort of quarterback, blonde, sandy blonde hair, you know. Um, so those are things that I can sort of, they're part, they're experiential images that I have, but they're, you know, might be difficult to articulate in fully general terms, descriptive terms. Um, they're contextually malleable. So in one context, my, what I thoughts I associate with um, being a quarterback might be very different from what I associate in a different context. Um, same with, say, uh, thinking about Barack Obama, for instance. Um, and then as my talk about quarterbacks was intended to sort of bring out, there's something, you know, they, uh, characterizations are representations of a topic and, you know, you know how this topic is, you think this topic is. This uh, is a truth of the properties that are uh, instantiated. So I'm not, like, deluded about the statistical profile of quarterbacks in college or, you know, pro basketball. I don't, uh, pro football, I don't think that they're, um, all sort of, you know, uh, well, maybe I didn't think they all say that, but um, that they all have like this sort of, you know, quarterback face that I sort of imagine in my, but that's sort of somehow that that look um, is somehow fitting in my, for my way of thinking about them. If I was going to cast a quarterback in the movie, I would look for. Um, and I can ignite, and, and so there are features that I can admit that are sort of, I can think of as fitting for a character, a subject, an individual, even though I don't think they're actually possessed or especially likely to be possessed, and uh, that I can think are not actually possessed, but it would be fitting for them to have. I can say something like, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I can say, you know, George is the kind of guy who should have um, uh, toilet paper the school left on Halloween, you know, in high school. He's just that kind of guy, even if I don't think he actually did, right? So I can sort of be imputing what it would be fitting for him to do, even if I don't think he actually had a property. And then I can say, you know, I've never understood why George was a, you know, a comparative literature major. It just like doesn't fit with who he is, right? So, so there's a these potential gap between fittingness and truth. I think that's interesting and sort of there's, a, I think fittingness is a kind of aesthetic uh, dimension sort of um, and I think that can be important and interesting and positive in the context of <laughs> like literature and things like that I think it has insidious often negative effects in the context of thinking about the real world especially I think that's part of why stereotypes are so pernicious and persistent in the face of counterexamples um, but I don't think for that reason we should ignore that I think we should acknowledge that we have this tendency to sort of think about things in intuitive terms, how they should be in some sense, and we should recognize that our minds tend to do that thing. Um, in some cases, it might be good. In some cases, it might be pernicious. OK, so this, so far, I've just been talking about what sorts of things go into characterizations, a lot of things, including sort of uh, um, imagistically vivid things, experientially vivid things, and this weird property of fittingness. Now, the really important thing for me is that uh, a characterization isn't just a pile of properties that you attribute to the thing as fitting for the thing, but rather there are structured representations. Um, so they're structured along at least two dimensions. 
one of prominence and one of in uh, so prominence is intuitively how much something sticks up relative to the background how noticeable it is um, uh, and um, how uh, sort of one way of thinking about it is like what's the first thing you would notice about this subject if you you know if you're asked off the top of your head what's the most important what's the first thing you would notice about this topic this person whatever um, that's itself a function of two, I follow Amos Tversky in thinking that this is itself a function of two further factors. One is intensity, which is high signal to noise ratio. Uh, and the second is diagnosticity. How useful is that feature for classifying relative to the uh, uh, kinds that you care about? So for instance, if you're thinking about nature, the brightness of the red of a flower is a is intensity one contributor to prominence another might be you know if a, the presence of a uh, um, diamond on a snake's head is useful for classifying it as poisonous or not that's going to sort of draw your attention and you know be more noticeable if you care about poisonousness um you know even if it's not really bright red right so they contribute together to like you know noticeability prominence the second dimension of, of ways in which uh, a feature can be more or less important is it can be more or less central for thinking about the topic in question. That is, it can be more or less explanatory or more or less explanatory net thinking about the thing. Um, for me, I understand that I am uh, aberrant in this respect, but for me, a really prominent feature of Barack Obama is his ears. They stick out. Um, and that's partly because my son has similar kind of ears. I don't think that is or motivate, you know, so um, uh, by contrast, uh, Donald Rumsfeld was a wrestler at Princeton. That is, seems sort of extreme in a way. So that's how those two dimensions come from. The, now, so the next thing, which is the thing that really, I think, motivates this talk, in my mind, motivates this, the intuitiveness has. It, it is intuitive the structure of prominence and centrality that characterizations have is in holistic on the uh, phenomenon, you know in just the way that a visual gestalt a concept can impose a visual gestalt on a uh, scene so look at the figure that's on the handout here this figure can be seen in one of two ways either as an old woman or um, so hopefully I see some furrowed brows, that's good. How many people can see, can see it as an old woman? Good. How many people can see it as a young woman? Good. How many people cannot see it as an old woman? Excellent. How many people cannot see it as a young woman? Interesting. Okay. So, um, so one thing that this brings out is presumably like the four or five of you believe that it can be seen as an old woman. Uh, but it's not locking in for you in the relevant kind of, in the same way that seeing it as an old woman, as a young woman is. Uh, so, so it's subject to the will, but only partly subject to the will. If you can see the figure in both ways, you can sort of basically switch back and forth at will, but you might not be able to see it both ways. Oh, she, I, she's locked in now, I can see. The <laughs> next thing, and I hope that there's somebody who still can't see, can, were you, did you raise your hand you couldn't see it both ways? Correct. Can you still not see it both ways? That's right. Awesome, okay. So and you can't see it as an old woman, right? Correct. Okay, great. So um, now I hope with just a little time I can bring you to see it. Uh, so I, there's no guarantee that any one thing I can say to you will make it lock in, but some information I can provide can help, right? So um, take the, you can't see it as an old woman, right? So take the young woman's necklace. That's the old woman's mouth. Take the still no response here. Take the young woman's the the young woman's um, yeah. ear. That's when she woman like this profile. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> so, so pieces of information can help and create. Uh, there may be outline. We can talk. If there are other people who are still stuck. Um, so, so thank you for participating in this, you know, experiment. Um, uh, pieces of information can help. The first one didn't do it, the second one did. 
what happened presumably when, I mean, I think you probably experienced the sense of, uh, now it's clicked together. Now it, you know, it hangs together in an intuitive hole in a way that it didn't before. When, it, when you switch back and forth between the two ways of seeing the scene, uh, the different constituent elements mean different things, as I was illustrating by saying, you know, this is that. Um, and also they shift in their structures of prominence and centrality, right? So their differences, like if you erased the um, old woman, the wart on the old woman's nose, it wouldn't make much of a difference to the old woman, but it might um, you know, seriously compromise or uh, maybe undermine your capacity to see the figure as a young lady, right? So there are different features. They hang together in different ways. They're more or less prominent. They're more or less important. And you'll be what it is. Okay. So, um, okay. That's all. Um, yeah, I want, I'll leave that there. Uh, the next thing I want to, so, so far I've just been talking about characterizations, which are the materials that go into sort of metaphorical comprehension and I think are pervasive across our thinking about the, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, the world in general. Next thing is to say, what are frames? Uh, what happens in, what in particular, what are metaphorical frames? So frames are cases where you use one characterization to think about something else, to impose an overall organizational structure on your thinking about something, including something else. Um, in the case of metaphor in particular, uh, you, you know, it's something distinct, right? I'm just going to keep going because I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to skip through a bunch of these things. What happens when you have a frame uh, for structuring your understanding about something else is that uh, um, you seek, start with the most prominent central features in your thinking about the, the framing characterization. So if you're thinking about Juliet is the sun, you start with the most prominent and central features of your contextually operative uh, representation of the sun and look for matches to that in your understanding of uh, Juliet. When you find such matches, you bring them to greater <laughs> prominence and centrality than they were in the case of, and then they were previously. The result of this kind of matching process is a restructured understanding of Juliet. Okay. Um, uh, when I say you do this, typically it's going to be tacit and automatic and sort of low level in the way that this sort of gestalt was in the case of the visual case, but it may be effortful, partly as illustrated as in the uh, gestalt case, mm -hmm. the visual case. Um, and then one th matches can be more or less direct. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, the very same feature is matched, like the color of the hair is the same as the color of her, uh, of copper. It could be similarity along a, 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 a uh, as you, it can be similarity along a qualitative dimension, like a degree of intelligence. If I say he's a real Einstein, I communicate that he's very smart, but probably not as smart as Einstein really was, um, or as I think Einstein was. It may be itself an analogical mapping, like um, uh, identity in higher order relations, like the wrestler bounced off the ropes like a billiard ball off the wall. There's a, a same relation of causing uh, of, of uh, hitting, causing a collision, but different elements in that structure. That's like one kind of match you can have. And then there can be actually, I think, metaphorical matches within this process of metaphorical structural alignment, but uh, it's itself sort of, it has to be a simpler, it's a recursive process where it has to be a simpler kind of metaphorical match. And we can talk about that if you want. Finally, feature introduction can occur when you introduce a new feature to your thinking about the subject, say Juliet, when there are a whole bunch of matches, especially structurally uh, aligned matches, but there's one element missing. So you can map a whole bunch of elements. You can take a whole bunch of elements, say, in your understanding of the sun and find a bunch of matches for those in your understanding of Juliet. Uh, but there's one feature in that cluster, in that kernel that remains unmatched, right? And so you can say, ah, I wonder if Juliet has that feature. And especially in the context of communication, of conversation, you can say, ah, the, hear the speaker must be intending for me to, you know, introduce that feature. So uh, that conversation is a special important driver of feature introduction, but it can happen in cognition, just in um, solitary cognition as well. Okay, last thing to say about perspectives. So far, I've talked about characterizations, these, uh, the m mental materials, the cognitive materials. Materials, on, intuitive cognitive materials on which uh, uh, intuitive thinking operate. I've talked about frames, which are using one characterization to structure your understanding of something else. For me, perspectives are open-ended dispositions to form characterization. They're tools for thought. They are open-ended in the sense that they sort of like take any new, they're ways of taking in new information and assimilating it to your existing structures. Um, okay.
So that's my rapid fire tour through my theory of sort of the kind of cognition that underlies metaphorical comprehension. Um, so now, what implications does that have for our understanding of, uh, for our assessment of the usefulness of metaphor uh, in learning and in the search for knowledge? Um, so uh, one thing to say, so I, as I've said, uh, as I've hinted, characterizations and perspectives are ubiquitous in our thinking about, you know, talk and thought and talk about the world in general. As I, again, hinted, there's especially uh, uh, context of thing like you know, uh, dogs or, or, or you know uh, women are submissive things like that uh, mosquitoes carry West Nile virus perspectives frames characterizations are metaphorical perspectives are especially powerful characterization in particular between uh, thinking of Juliet as the sun, thinking about Achilles as the sun, which is something Homer says, and thinking about Louis the Fourteenth as the sun, you know, the sun king in France. So those are very different. They have very different effects. Part of that is they're coming from different contexts, right? Different history. The sun in operation in each case. But more importantly, the fact that the subjects are so different I mean there are different matches get found uh, with the sun. And so you get a very different meaning. So there's an interaction dependent schema that's set up between the subject and the frame. The other thing that's really, um, I think, really sort of, uh, again, cognitively, powerful and for that reason potentially pernicious but also potentially good is that specifically the fact that metaphorical perspectives are analogical makes them especially cognitively powerful so because the speaker the hearer has to or the user of a metaphor the entertainer of a metaphor has to do this Uh, makes, uh, he says, seductively co-opts her into uh, buying, into accepting the result. Um, this sort of very, uh, you know, sort of philosophical a priori speculation has been borne out in the last, uh, you know, 10 years uh, with empirical research, uh, some of which is uh, published in a paper with the title, Resistance is Useless, uh, no, sorry, Resistance is Futile, um, uh, Analogical Insertion in Memory. So the, uh, I can talk about the paradigm later, but basically when you present uh, subjects with uh, Northwestern College, students uh, with a uh, two pairs of ta texts which are analogically related so uh, one about the persecution of uh, left-handed people through history and another about discrimination against gay people um, subjects have a hard time remembering they they in, they think they recall as familiar as having actually been presented to them uh, sentences which are uh, which are only derived analogically by comparison of the two uh, the two uh, texts, right? So they remember as familiar as something that was actually told to them, something that they derived uh, through the juxtaposition of these two kinds of texts. <laughs> and this was true even when they found the analogy, they thought the analogy was unsound. So even when they were prejudiced against uh, gay people and thought, you know, well, per persecution against uh, left-handed people clearly wrong, but those gay people, they really deserve to be marginalized, whatever. They still had a hard time tracking uh, what the um, what had actually been said in this uh, in the text. So uh, that's again a reason, one reason for thinking, you know, that why that's an indication of the way in which metaphor is a powerful rhetorical and cognitive tool for good or for ill, right? And so, you know, you want to think about that. Okay, so now. What about in the search for knowledge as opposed to the uh, aiming for rhetorical power? Um, so one thing that I definitely philosophers say a lot, but that you might get, um, you know, I think other people uh, um, tend to, you know, scientists say as well, 
is, yeah, okay, yeah, metaphors can manipulate our patterns of thinking. Maybe they can do something where they can draw attention to features we, new metaphors can draw attention to features that we neglected or were failing to pay attention to. But they can't underwrite genuine knowledge. Because after all, they're false. Metaphors are not really true, right? And so how could they underwrite real knowledge? Uh, maybe they could be way stations on the way to something, but they can't themselves provide anything like knowledge. And you might think here that the, the idea would be something like the use of a metaphor could be like um, uh, Kukule's purported dream of Ouroboros. So, you know, classic, famously, uh, Kukule uh, dreamed, sat before a fire and dozed off and dreamed of a snake biting its own tail. And he woke up and said, benzene ring, right? And then went out and did a bunch of research and, in fact, you know, discovered the the structure of benzene. And there it looks like, you know, this dream, this inspiration may be inspired or led to, you know, uh, knowledge, but it couldn't itself constitute knowledge, right? How could that be? Um, so I want to argue for a, a stronger connection, potential connection between metaphor and genuine understanding and in that sense, knowledge. One thing, I think that that kind of dismissive attitude relies on a very reductivist, um, implausibly thin notion of what understanding is. So I think on any good understanding of understanding, um, knowledge, uh, understand, inquiry, understanding, knowledge, aims at more than just sort of totaling up a bunch of truths, right? What we want are substantial, uh, relevant truths, explanatory truths. And to do that, we need to have a kind of structural understanding of the domain and ability to pick out what are the relevant and uh, uh, features that we should be paying attention to, and an ability to identify what the structures, especially causal structures, that connect those various features are. That's exactly the kind of understanding that metaphor can provide, this kind of structural understanding. Um, OK. And wait, I'll just leave that. Um, further, even if you thought that so that, I think, is to say part of understanding is having this kind of structural grasp. And I have to say, every time I teach a class that I've taught before, again, I basically each time cut the amount of material that I'm actually presenting and emphasize more the narrative and the structure in which the material that I once thought was so important is uh, needs to be you know, hung. Because uh, without that, the students don't actually understand the material. And the things that when I think about what I want them to take away you know, five years down the road, whatever, I mean, it's this structural understanding. And it's this ability that comes with that to assimilate new information, to read a newspaper article and think critically about way minds work uh, in the light of this new evidence that's coming in. It's not the particular details that I'm so interested in usually. So structural grasp is a really important part of understanding and knowledge. And metaphor is the kind of thing that can provide that. So you might say, okay, okay, okay. Metaphors help to provide this kind of structure. They reconfigure our attention and lead us to pay attention to you know good, important things. But they can't actually um, uh, give us new knowledge. All they can do is sort of give us you know heuristic useful uh, tools for manipulating stuff we already know. I think even that is uh, too dismissive of an attitude. So one thing that metaphors can do is guide discovery through feature introduction. So I alluded to this briefly, especially in the case of um, communication, but it can happen in the context of scientific inquiry as well. You can have a metaphor and look at the sort of uh, structural alignment between the two domains and say, look, um, you know, there's all these interesting mappings in this kernel over here. Could it be that uh, there's an analogous feature to this one that's not yet mapped in the new domain? And so that's a new that a way of generating a useful and potentially you know testable hypothesis. Um, metaphors can also, I think, uh, allow us to talk about things that we couldn't talk about and think about things that we couldn't about otherwise by giving us, get, setting up a kind of analogical equation. We have a domain that we do understand, um, and we can use that to sort of feel our way into a domain that we don't understand as well, and thereby sort of allow us to um, uh, get a grip on a complex interacting phenomena where we couldn't, you know, everything's such a mess, like in studying the mind or uh, in the uh, brain, everything's so complicated and interacting, a complex interacting phenomena that you can't sort of directly point to the feature you're interested in, in the way you can point to an instance of gold and say, I want to investigate that, right? You can't say, I want to point to an instance of memory and study that, right? You can only get at memory through this interaction and lots of different other phenomena. Mm -hmm. Having a metaphor can 
can sort of give you the kind of structure that might help you to get a grip on something you can't actually sort of probe directly. And then allow you to set up, you know, um, so what it can do is set up an analogical equation that then you can sort of try to articulate, try to map systematically. You have this intuitive understanding and you try to map it more and more systematically uh, and in probe, try to think about ways in which you could probe for the presence of that structure and in that particular feature uh, in a way you might not have been able to do otherwise. Okay. So that was all, you know, I come here to celebrate metaphor. You shouldn't be a metaphor skeptic. You should, you know, sort of embrace the power of metaphor for uh, in inquiry and indeed in the in final in knowledge as we, you know, in the final state of knowledge um, as part of a genuine contribution to understanding. But I think it's equally important to have a critical, to use metaphors critically, precisely because this kind of Kind of, you know, there's this risk of analogical insertion in memory, right? And there's this risk of um, uh, the fact that metaphor provides us with an intuitive structure for understanding a domain can make it especially, can, can lead to, um, uh, I guess I was going to say this later, but um, can lead to a kind of epistemic complacency. We have a feeling that we understand. We have a sense that, you know, yeah, it all hangs together. And that can lead us to neglect the ways in which we don't understand and uh, so it's to be complacent. So I think it's important to articulate and try to actively employ criteria for um, uh, assessing and uh, transcending particular metaphors. So, um, and some of these are, you know, these are uh, criteria for assessing the epistemic aptness of the frame that's produced by a metaphor, um, which are not in necessarily, I don't think, aren't in the same way in play in, say, the use of metaphor in fiction or poetry, right? So this is a way in which it's interesting to think about contrast between sort of knowledge-guided domains or, you know, scientific domains widely broadly construed and uh, aesthetic domains. So I have here, in fact, that is, if we're just looking at our, our how we're how do we assess how we should be using it? And then a bunch of four criteria. So thinking of how do we decide from that whether a, a metaphor is a good one, a useful one. So first, in, in the internal criteria, we, we prefer, so subjects do in fact prefer and evaluate as better. And it seems like these are normative. This is not just a descriptive claim, but a normative claim. People should. Their subjects are right to uh, assess as better matches mappings between matches between the domains that preserve um, that, that that rely upon higher order relational features um, rather than just base level features. So if you're thinking about the ways in which electricity is like water, you want to think about sort of uh, structural features of flow and um, sort of um, volume and whatever rather than specific features about um, I don't know the phenomenology of what electricity when it touches it and what you know water does to it or something like that. Um, similarly, relatedly, mappings that preserve deep kernels in precise or isomorphism, so that really map a cluster of features that are related to ex uh, another cluster of features in the same structure. Those are preferred to sort of you know partial and consistent mappings uh, uh, and more piecemeal mappings. Um, this is, I don't think, is nearly as operative in the interpretation of literary metaphors. This is, a, again, a place, so it's a way in which I think if we're thinking about metaphors in the context of scientific inquiry uh, and, the, and the search for knowledge, um, that we're thinking about, we're, 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 metaphor is um, valued and apt to the extent that it approximates um, and can be made to approximate analogy. And I don't think that's as important in the context of uh, literature. Um, OK. Now, the external criteria. So I've got a, I, I'm looking at a, a, a metaphor, and I'm trying to decide, is this a good way of understanding this, dom this domain that I, of inquiry? How should I try to figure this? You know, I think that it, with, how should I decide whether it's an apt metaphor? Um, one thing is, as I mentioned earlier, we have these intuitions of fittingness and we have intuition, well, you know, somebody should or something should have a certain kind of property, even though it might not actually, um, it shouldn't have a certain property, even though it might actually, um, this is especially pernicious and involved in the case of generics, uh, statements of generic statements, um, intuitions of fittingness in, if you're assessing sort of, uh, the, you know, uh, epistemic aptness of a metaphor, intuitions of fittingness to be marginalized, you shouldn't be relying heavily on them. 
if you acknowledge that our minds are sort of deeply prone to use these kinds of intuitions of fitness, you should be, they should be harnessed towards sort of um, uh, more truth-guided uh, applications rather than um, sort of the um, free flights of fancy that sometimes uh, they sometimes ha uh, uh, occupy or take on in the context of, say, literature. Um, more importantly, assignments of intensity, which was one factor in prominence. Intensity was high signal and noise ratio. If a feature is treated as very intense in this metaphorical interpretation, then it should, that should reflect the actual statistical distribution of that property in the world, right? The actual sort of signal to noise ratio of that property in the world. That's something that can be objectively assessed. Um, assignments of diagnosticity, uh, which is the, uh, the other factor in prominence, you know, how useful it is for classifying things of that kind, like this uh, diamond on the snake's head. Those should track explanatorily useful categories. And in particular, that's an, what, what categories we should be using is partly a function of our practical purposes, like am I interested in not getting bitten by a poisonous uh, snake, or am I interested in sort of, you know, uh, uh, tracking how rare or, you know, sort of yeah, how rare a snake is. But different purposes are going to lead to different categories being more or less um, diagnostic um, and more or less explanatorily useful. And also assignments of diagnosticity should track actually relevant causal structure, right? Um, which, you know, sort of categories do divide nature relatively at its joints. Partly a function of what, how nature is carved at its own joints, partly a factor of function of our interests and purposes. Lastly, assignments of centrality, how, where you have, is this feature really central in your overall thinking about the proper question? That should track the actual causal structure of the phenomenon you're thinking about, if you're interested in inquiry. And that's, you know, maybe less important in the case, again, of literature. Okay, so those would give us some uh, some criteria by which we can assess both from the inside and from the outside uh, whether a metaphorical frame is apt. Um, but the fact remains that you know their metaphors do you know induce this feeling of complacency of at this this epistemic complacency precisely by providing us with an intuitive grip on a subject. Right? They can both uh, lead us to neglect known but unfitting features, right? We're like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that, you know, the brain has this kind of, like, kind of annoying analog, you know, uh, property, but wouldn't it be so much nicer if it was digital? Well, let's just think about the ways in which uh, electrical spiking is really like digital, you know, uh, uh, um, signaling. Um, so we tend to neglect or downplay known but unfitting features, uh, because can do that because of a meta, we're using a certain kind of metaphor. And we can also fail to seek out unknown unknowns, right? We say, ah, yeah, I basically know how this phenomenon works. So, you know, uh, why should I, we're, you know, I'm not be, I'm not propelled in the same kind of way to seek out uh, things I know that I, I don't know what I don't know. The reason which I might have good reason to know that there are things that I don't know what I don't know. That was Rumsfeld. Um, so, um, so, I'm going to skip that next point. So, I think here there's a kind of very natural move for a philosopher to make, and this is a move that I am, I do want to make in part, which is say, well, this is the place where metaphorical comprehension, metaphorical engagement gives out. We should shift to logic. We should shift to rationality, right? And I do think that that's why I think that part of what we want to do in using a metaphor critically is to think about, um, you know, which things really do follow, which mappings, which uh, uh, inferences really do follow given the assumptions you really do believe about the domain inquiry uh, that we're you know, focused on. Um, but I also think that if we recognize uh, the depth and pervasiveness in, uh, with which we use characterizations, like just how powerful uh, characterizations and therefore metaphors are in our everyday thinking about uh, the world, that it's uh, a kind of, it's an ideal, it's an idealization and a potentially dangerous idealization to think that we can get away from, we should just shift to purely logical thinking. So this is something that happens, uh, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes here. Um, so, you know, philosophy uh, has a real problem with women. We're like, uh, there's 20% tenure, tenure track women in philosophy. And people have recently noticed this. And so, um, They've said, oh, well, there's all these problems about sort of women and you know, implicit bias and stuff. So what we're going to do is we're really going to focus on, you know, really the credentials we should really care about in hiring, right? Um, and we're going to ignore all that implicit bias. Stuff. 
But we can't just will ourselves into thinking purely rationally and logically in uh, part of the point about implicit bias is it, you know, keeps on going even when you think you're thinking the right thing. And so uh, I think in a way, it, these aren't mutually exclusive options, but instead of just trying to be as logical as possible, though I do think that that's an important sort of um, uh, uh, step, I think we should also think about the critical use of metaphors uh, in a way we should try to fight fire with fire. So um, not just in these cases of pernicious sort of you know stereotypical metaphors, but also in the case of inquiry. So I think one thing can be very useful is An enzymatic sort of uh, catalyst uh, is, you know, there's a sort of biological model that some people have started to use, a more biological model. Um, and that, that might be, you know, that it, it might help us to notice features that we would otherwise neglect, that we know about, that we have been neglecting, or to suggest new avenues for inquiry that, you know, we wouldn't have thought of if we were just sticking with this, you know, mind as a computer sort of uh, metaphor throughout. Um, so it's better, I think, to, so it's not, we should try to assess in straightforward logical terms the validity of the inferences that we're drawing. Actively cultivate alternative, and we should, you know, logically is, you employ the criteria that I mentioned above. On the other hand, I think we should also actively cultivate alternative metaphors, alternative frames, um, uh, uh, actively and explicitly. Um, and I think in, in order to do this, in order to sort of dislodge our complacency with the use of the particularly contemporary um, frames and metaphors, uh, by intellectual history, uh, and especially the history of science, is so important because it can give you like, what in the world was Aristotle thinking about, you know, the interaction between uh, what the imagination was. It looks insane. And then you start to think, sort of piece it through and bit by bit, think about how you would translate this into a contemporary model, whatever. That might lead you to notice features that you wouldn't have otherwise. So things that, uh, frames that other people have found compelling through time or through uh, other cultures um, that seem very sort of alien to us can provide us with these kinds of alternative frames that can dislodge the kind of epistemic complacency uh, that can come with metaphor. Um, and so we can have both genuine comprehension, genuine, uh, you know, sort of the genuine structural intuitive grip that metaphor can provide without the kind of blinkering uh, that metaphor can also lead us into. Thanks. Thanks. That's, that's great. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, can I just ask, should I feel my own questions or sure. should I? Uh, so, thinking about this question of aptness, right, which is what they need to ask, um, this, this has been purely as a question. Uh, could there be another kind of aptness which has to do with uh, the developmental appropriateness? Ah. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, so that, for example, for a person at a particular level of understanding, that even though we know this metaphor isn't that great, mm -hmm. yeah. it is pretty good yeah. for them where they are. And we hope that over time we'll actually yeah. demolish that yeah. with better metaphors later. Yeah, yeah uh, certainly that seems right. Um, uh, one thing that is uh, notable is that uh, it sort of in developmentally both uh, sort of uh, for all cognition and with respect to specific domains, even if you're talking about like an adult or a quasi-adult like a college student, um, uh, there is a sign of kind of progression from focus on base level features to focus on structural features. Um, and so, you know, cultivating the capacity for that kind of shift uh, is something that, um, you know, not, that does happen through time and it's something I think that education can and often sometimes does foster. Um, but you might not be able to sort of leap from just attention to base level features to you know the highest level of structural understanding at the very you know at the very beginning um, 
uh, you might just lose a grip, right? Um, and your other domains of knowledge might not be robust enough in order to sort of support that high level of understanding. Yeah, um, and I have to say, like when I read about electricity, um, uh, and you know, so I understand. So that this is sort of how the. I mean, I never took a class in electrical engineering, so. Uh, but um, I, you know. I know that theorizing about, and especially the teaching of electricity, proceeds largely by analogy, or you know, the analogies play a really important role. So I'd like to understand them and really, you know. So um, I'm pretty good with the sort of model, the liquid uh, model of electric uh, explanation of electricity, and then I can sort of get my way into, uh, you know, so this is embarrassing personal confession, get my way into the next, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, structural in some ways still metaphorical explanations, but I start to sort of lose or whatever. So I'm sort of at that point. Um, I know there's something better, but I'm not really there yet. You know? but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and that might be as an educator, you want to both, so you might want to both be looking for uh, sort of uh, metaphors that will be, uh, you know, metaphors might be good because they're going to lead to focus on structure. Um, but there's also partly there's richness, like how many features does it encompass, and how precise is the isomorphism, and there's also like how easy to is it to get right away, right, and how sort of uh, how so much does the gestalt snap in for most people, and so those might be think trade offs that you'd have to think about um, pedagogically or you know rhetorically. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm gonna call on Drew because. <laughs> um, so, are metaphors always language mediated? I'm thinking about you know visual representations yeah. and signs. Yeah, great. Um, this I think is a really, I think this is a question that sort of divides implicitly a lot of people's talk about study of metaphor, um, and it's some. Okay. Um, I don't think that I don't think of metaphor. Um, and it's a, a, a question on which I have conflicted. Um, so notice I did a lot of this talk about one characterization structuring our understanding of something else, which it is known not to be, right? Um, none of that, that, that was, you know, you could get there without language, right? Um, I do think there are pictorial, some pictorial metaphors where the, that is, which are not just a picture of a metaphor, um, which can also definitely occur, but where the picture is serving as the sort of vehicle, the framing vehicle for another thing. So I think that that's, you know, I, I have been careful to avoid defining metaphors as essentially linguistic. Um, I think that a lot of the really interesting action in the cognitive structures and mechanisms. I also think that there are distinctive questions questions about like, metaphor as a, ling a, a linguistic phenomenon, um, and I think metaphor especially powerfully uses language. Um, uh, so you don't get metaphors as pervasively and flexibly and, uh, you know, sort of um, yeah, in other representational domains. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's all I'll say right now. Uh, you got a question? Yeah, I mean, it was very much like the question that you had, but along those lines, um, how do uh, synonyms kind of complicate different words? Yes. You know, if we're talking about linguistics, yeah. so many different words yes. for uh, yeah. one idea. Yeah. So, um, so I, you know, I was just talking about characterizations, right? Now, and and I said I make this contrast between characterizations and concepts, uh, and you know I would know about that now, but I can talk about it later. So uh, one thing is, so now we get to that question, right? So um, synonyms could be, often they are, um, uh, so, so they're expressions which are coextensive, they're about the same thing, but they have different sort of inferential powers built into them, right? So renate and coordinate are the classic examples, has a heart and has a kidney, right? Definitely about different things, but all the instances that have hearts have kidneys. But those are clearly different concepts because what it takes, the sort of conditions they're imposing and what you understand when you understand them, the kind of inferences you can draw with them, those are different, right? Um, there are other expressions which are, but this, so they're not synonyms. There are other expressions which are synonyms, but which differ markedly in their metaphorical powers. So my favorite example here, which I 
get from the, uh, Joseph Stern, uh, another philosopher who works on metaphor, uh, which he got from the public, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, domain. It was uh, Tanya Harding is the bead of sweat in a pool of perspiration, right? So the idea was like, you know, so there's this difference, sweating and perspiring are, you know, synonyms, um, but sweat has this kind of like, you know, the connotations has a different characterization associated with them, with them perspire. perspire. Um, uh, and, you know, so the metaphor is exactly drawing on that and that contrast in those cases. Um, so that's one reason, there are many reasons, but that's one reason why, um, an analysis of metaphor just in terms of linguistic meaning is very ill-fated and people tried this in the 70s to give like fully linguistic accounts of metaphor in terms of the resources that are in the language and basically to do that you end up exploding what's in the language because like these kinds of all these you know associations and especially associations like that you and I could build up in a particular context uh, you know uh, these very context specific associations so um, it in that sense is really a uh, sort of this cognitive phenomenon rather than a specifically linguistic phenomenon but the words are you know more or less associated with certain they suggest and are more can be more or less associated with certain kinds of uh, characterizations um that so they go beyond word meaning in a sort of strict sense but there are connections between which words and uh which characterizations which words you utter which characterizations you're signaling and that's you know um yeah so is that enough of a response I feel like you, you, I didn't really answer the thing you really cared about. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out at what point do you start, like, the depth of uh, how you're analyzing something. Mm -hmm. um, if words do have uh, multiple uh, synonyms, um, and let, let's just say, for instance, you know, the ones that are, don't have different connotations, um, but the ones that are as true to the idea as possible. So you're imagining a case where we have two expressions which express the same, not just are about the same thing, but express the same concept, um, and they don't have markedly different characterizations. No, like let's say one sentence, and you know, let's say one of the words, uh, you could easily replace it with a different yeah. word. Good. So let me give an example. So maybe going back to my example at the end, and this might be especially in the case of like scientific inquiry. Um, so the difference in connotation are going to often that we, I was just talking about, like sweat and perspective, is definitely uh, often going to be in terms of images and of emotions that are evoked, and in the context of knowledge and inquiry, we're going to be trying to sideline those things. Or we're going to be using talking about characterizations that aren't going to be so deeply bound up with those. So the kind of case that you're going to be thinking of is going to be more likely. So going back to the case I was just talking about, about embarrassingly about um, electricity, it seems like water and liquid, right, are basically going to be doing the same kind of thing. Right, if you're using that as your model for your metaphor for understanding uh, electrical, uh, you know, behavior, and so there it wouldn't make much of a difference. Um, and I would think it, it could still, it, yeah. So that with that, yeah. So it's going to depend, and yeah, period. Um, yes. I'm wondering about uh, applications. And I was talking briefly about how teaching the deaf students you really can't use metaphors, and I, and I'm wondering if what the behind. So so. Is there any research, do you have any to comment about, for example, we had a speaker recently who was talking about students who aren't formally good at science, maybe doing things in their lives that's very metaphorical yep. to learn yep. how to do science, yep. not doing it yes. the normal way. Yep. Is, there, is there any information about application of, let's see how it works if we do it through metaphor, versus mm -hmm. let's see how it works yep. with no metaphor. Yep. How that kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, um, uh, okay. A couple things to say. First thing is, um, so a lot of the sort of stuff that I've been sort of citing, uh, you know, I put these, you know, completely useless uh, citations on the handout, just the name, get, you know, a bunch of that, the work that I'm, empirical work I'm thinking about, especially about learning, is from Deirdre Gettner's uh, lab. And she's especially focused on analogy and structure mapping, right? And um, I have a kind of frenemy relationship with uh, Gettner because I, in this particular context, because I also, I really, I think this emphasis on structure mapping is really important in, for explaining the cognitive power of metaphor. But I don't, she's really focused on analogy and thinks about metaphor as only a sort of messy, lame instantiation of analogy. 
And I think part of what metaphor can provide additional power precisely because it's intuitive mm -hmm. and involves appeal to the base level features in a way that it analogy tends to focus on these higher structural features. So to go back here, I think metaphor can be a kind of way station, uh, both rhetorically and cognitively, and sort of in the case of inquiry, from a really base level, like, you know, sort of um, intuitive, engaged uh, uh, way of thinking about a domain or understanding of a domain to this more sort of uh, abstract structural one. And so, uh, yeah, to go back to the original question, it, you know, might be that um, so a lot of her work supporting the efficacy of uh, meta of, of metaphor, or this kind of stuff in learning and applications focuses on analogy, right. whereas I think there might be, in, you know, interestingly different implications in thinking about metaphor. Um, and I don't know, uh, but her, you know, sort of real interest in analogy means that she hasn't been doing those studies exactly. So that's so. Okay. Um, the second thing uh, is I wouldn't, I mean, I, uh, and again, going, so, so, uh, sign language is a language, first of all. Second of all, it, so it, it involves the same kind of structures as, you know, uh, um, uh, spoken or written language. And so affords the same kinds of expressive resources in that way. Um, the second thing is that sign language ex exploits um, really interesting, in a, in a way, yeah, this returns to this question, in really interesting ways, exploits the iconic dimension of the space, the representational space, um, in ways that might actually foster uh, analogical or metaphorical engage, you know, cognition, in the sense that, um, so it uses sort of um, the, the actual spatial arrangement of, you know, in, of the actual space in front of the um, signer um, in a structured way to map on to elements in the domain of discourse in ways that are, you know, an analogical uh, and sometimes not sort of precisely analogical in ways that can be, it can be very interesting. And so there, there might be, uh, well, there could be interesting applications there actually for positive rather than negative kinds of effects. Yeah. What is metaphor? Um, you said it's intuitive. Is it essentially human to use metaphor, or is this a Western concept? Right. Are there other right. languages that use it? Um, so uh, I do think that it's an essential. So, so Deirdre Gettner, to go back to you know Gettner, she thinks that uh, a similarity mapping, perception of similarity plus language, is oh, the you know, these two things. She thinks that uh, structure map, structural attention to structural, you know, structure mm -hmm. mapping. Um, is, I think she would say, is the basic sort of uh, aspect of human cognition, but it is something that other animals display, uh, it, you know, do, if not in the great wishes we do or whatever. Um, other animals do also something that's a little bit like languagey stuff. Um, and uh, she could, it's when you get the two of them together, you get the nuclear explosion that is human cognition, right? Um, so that's, I mean, and you know, so, um, uh, I am not in the business of making these strong sort of evolutionary kinds of claims, but you know, um, it does seem like you get a bit of both of those things, and especially a bit of analogical mapping in non-human animals. Um, but it's much more constrained, uh, and so the sort of rich and richness and flexibility of it does seem like something that's distinctively human. And yes, it is universal across, um, uh, you know, I mean, pretty much, you know pretty much. Uh, though there are, of course, really interesting differences in um, sort of in rhetorical style, right? So in when it, it's uh, appropriate to use a metaphor and the extent to which it's appropriate to use a metaphor and in the degree to which you emphasize um, alignment and consistency of metaphors uh, and when sort of cross-cutting, you know, so, so we at least English teachers love to sort of impugn mixed metaphor, um, but mixed metaphor can also have interesting positive rhetorical forces, as I was indicating at the end. Um, and some cultures celebrate that, some uh, put it in, you know, say that it should only be in literary writing, you know, so those are, di there are different norms about the use of metaphor and different uh, normative evaluations of which kinds of metaphors are going to be, you know, sort of, um, especially appreciated, um, but the sort of metaphor making looks like it's something that is uh, inherent across, uh, you know. But I would also say that it looks like, and that I, I think reflects a kind of this deep structural, you know, 
precise isomorphism of structural mapping from this structure to exactly the same structure in this different that kind of rather than analogy. Um, again, the frenemy aspect of the. Um, so, what should I be doing one with more, the, yeah. one, one more and then we're there? Um, so, you did, I think you did a good job kind of like maintaining that metaphor is right down. But so far, I guess from an education learning standpoint, can you talk a little bit about transitioning between metaphors? Ah, great. And yeah, 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 yeah. Capture that. Right. Um, Right, so I wanted to say something about the ways in which you know metaphors lead us into epistemic complacency and how we should fight back against that. I actually think that there's a way in which uh, metaphor can cut against epistemic complacency because it wears its incompleteness on its sleeve in a way that other frames don't necessarily. Uh, you know, so we can think if if you're taking a feature which is central to a domain and saying, look, this is the central feature to explaining this domain. The very fact that it's actually true of a class that only can make you think, well, now I really must have really understood it, right? Whereas inevitably, because it's a frame, it's going to be highlighting some features and downplaying other features. And there's likely to be some mismatch between, you know, uh, the structure we have and the sort of actual structure in the world. Um, so there can be, you know, the very, uh, very avowed falsity of the metaphor can make it, um, you know, uh, epistemically invigorating. Um, I think that they, I mean, you know, this isn't something that I, have thought about really systematically, but uh, I would say something like, okay, now we've, so far, you know, in thinking about electricity in terms of water, we've really focused on these features. But now let's notice the features that are really, that we care about, we know about, about electricity that are absent from water and vice versa, right? Let's think about the features that water has uh, that electricity doesn't have. Why are there these mismatches? What, why, you know, uh, you know, and, Yes, that might be a hypothesis to seek and see whether there is, a, in fact, a feature we haven't missed. But if we know there is no such feature, then that itself demands explanation. That is something so that can, you can use that to dislodge and then say, okay, now let's take what kind of explanation will put that missing feature at the center. Okay, well, you know, so I think that would be a sort of useful bridge principle. Um, all right. Okay, well, let, please join me in thanking Liz. Thank you.